Hey, it's Talknosis, and look, we got Sola Jesus again. She's got a new album out. Uh, everybody, it's really debated what the definition of Gnosticism is, and I think people who watch and listen to the show regularly have picked up that my definition of Gnosticism is whatever I'm into this week. But that said, I, I see a lot of uh, Gnostic themes in Zola Jesus' work. Uh, I, I think we're going to talk about the title of her new album a little bit, but uh, we're really hyped to have you back on the show, Nika. Uh, it's a real honor. You know, I really consider you one of our, our greatest living musicians, I guess. Oh. Yeah, I think that's about right. So, uh, and if everybody doesn't know uh, her work, go out and buy it. And you know what? I usually do a, a, a plug for our Patreon at the top of the show, but uh, sign up for Zola Jesus Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Zola Jesus. And go to her homepage and uh, buy her new album, Archon. Get it on vinyl. Treat yourself. And uh, I'm assuming it's streaming. So, I mean, I, I know it's streaming. That's how I listen to it. So when you go to bed at night, open up your computer, go to Spotify, YouTube, you know, Apple Music, whatever it is you listen to music with, uh, turn the volume off on your computer, set it to repeat, and just have it play all night long. Just have it stream <laughs> over and over again, because we want to get that, that big, I don't know, 26 cents that Spotify would send you. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. And, Oh, sorry. And one more commercial, patreon.com slash Gnostic. Give us money so we can keep doing the show. If you can't give us money, that's fine. I don't have any money. Uh, you can help us out by telling people about the show, either sending out your favorite episode, which will be this one, telling people about the show, liking, subscribing, and one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. Um, Nika, yes. my first question is, why did you call the album Archon? Because <laughs> we're living in Archon times. <laughs> it's hard to avoid it. I mean, you know, I was thinking a lot about just the world that we're living in and the world that I made the record in, and it was just very traumatic, uh, kind of a bipolar world that's fed off of like this really heightened state of emotion that um, just feels very dark, very dark. And also just like all of the oligarchic power and everything, it just, yeah, very iconic times. Yeah, yeah. I, you know what? Obviously, I, I agree. And, you know, all of your albums sound cohesive to me. Like, I, I don't know if you set out to make them as concept albums or if there's, you know, if you have a bunch of songs and then when you're picking them for the albums, if there is some, some order in your mind or if it's coming together unconsciously. But, but I see this album and, and make sure, you know, this is a great thing about being an amateur critic or an interviewer. Like, please tell me whenever I'm wrong, right? Just be like, you know, pull the Marshall McLuhan and Annie Hall thing and be like, you don't understand my work at all. Um, <laughs> but uh, do you see Archon as a concept album or particularly interconnected? Uh, I mean, it definitely was made with this kind of whole world in mind. And so um, that's what I love about making albums, but also it makes them a lot of work is that everything needs to feel really cohesive and it's like it's different like each song is a different corner of this world that i'm trying to build and um that also includes my own personal catharsis through my own issues that i've been going through then also like this the sort of collective um just emotional tenor of the times it all comes into this conceptual i mean it's conceptual in that way and, and sonically but i'm not sure and the songs are actually all related too. So yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there, there's sort of the Gnostic said as above, so below. But I think we could also say as within, as without. And mm -hmm. and I think this album really does illustrate that principle. Like I think a lot of people can can get a lot out of it because they know what's going on in the world. Uh, they can see the sort of exterior focus. But uh, it's it's very moving and powerful the way that you're able to connect it to your to your inner landscape. And and I think that really comes across. Um, hmm. Nika, something cool that I stole from somebody smart that, that makes me sound smart when I say hmm. it is Gnosticism isn't about answers. It's about questions and about finding better questions. So what questions have been fascinating you lately? Lately or ever? Um, yeah, lately and ever. Yeah, go for all. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I feel like uh, I feel like a defective human being because I'm constantly having a lot of panic about just like why we're here like what what there's no there's no evidence or proof about why we're here other than just like you know the the history of humanity and so that really stresses me out <laughs> but then also living here in this world in this incarnation and and um having to deal with like 
just the the circumstances of of existence and of the world we're in is very um, overwhelming for me. Where it's like, this would be all so much easier if things just made sense. But nothing. Um, so I don't know. They're all like. I think about things very deeply and on um, like macro levels in a way, um, but then also within myself, like I've been doing a lot of shadow work and really like went through a strong ego death um, throughout the course of making this record. And that was really illuminating because it showed me just like how the ills of the world are within each of us as well. And so that we need to do the work to purge them. Um, and there's something to be said about remaining sharp and, and really keeping your mind sharp because it's so easy to get dragged into like this really dark emotional landscape um, these days. Yeah, for sure. But I, I think that that's all very profound and uh, Gnostic prophetess, <laughs> uh, <Nika laughs> Look, if, if you want to start a cult, you have the charisma, you got the aesthetics, you know, you've got a compound in the woods, like I'll sign <laughs> up. I'm so sure close. lots of people will. Yeah, I'm just not, I'm not convinced. I'm not, I'm not committed enough to convincing people to follow me. <laughs> and I think that really, that's what, that what makes it, that's what makes the cult is that, that narcissism to believe that you were the one that has the answer. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's uh, w w when you say that th that you feel like you're a defective human, uh, you know, I, I think that's right. But and that's the bad news. But the good news is so are all eight billion of us, <laughs> you know, exactly, like, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what it, I mean, that's what ultimately makes me feel so much empathy and love for, for every human it is because we're all just different incarnations of the same traumatic confusion and so it's like you know we're all in this together yeah like you, you know gnosticism actually says we, we come out of trauma in a cosmic way actually mm -hmm. basically we're born through trauma you know twice you know once cosmically divinity the through divinity and then again when we enter this world mm -hmm. and and i don't want you know, it's weird because, you know, I, I am a deacon. I, I have a small parish here in Montreal. But, I, you know, if I could flip a switch and make everybody in the world religious, I, I wouldn't flip that switch because there's so many paths to the truth. But but something I, I wish we did all share was this, this shared understanding of uh, lack, defectiveness, uh, trauma, this, this, this whole that is in everybody. Because, because one, that's, that's what unites us. And, and two, it, it, it does just make us more loving and understanding. You know, the, um, original sin was, is, is, and was a horrible idea. And of course it was very mainstream. So it was mainstream in many circles, but everybody once believed it in the West more or less. So I'm really glad that that's gone. Yeah. But, but at least one good thing about it was, and I'm not, I don't want original sin to come back, but one thing it did was, you know, it, it did allow everybody to, to have that connection, you know, that understanding of mm -hmm. this, of this, this whole, this lack uh, that, that, that we do all share. Uh, the other thing too, is if we don't realize that it is everybody, we all become heroes and villains, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes, and when I say we all become heroes and villains, it's not necessarily thinking that you're the hero and everybody else is a villain. It also makes us point to other people and say that they're heroes and they're perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it also allows us to find a lot of villains. And I, and I think, you know, that there's a lot of talk about call out culture, cancel culture and, and such. I, and I, I don't want to go into those cliches, but, but I think if we perhaps had this shared understanding of our, of our shared brokenness, you know, this, this wouldn't be an issue. Yeah. And I think that we're definitely poisoned by the Christian fundamentalism, at least here in the States, because that creates this like dichotomy of this binary between good versus evil and like righteous and evildoers. And so it always assumes you're coming from a place of where you're righteous. And I think in doing that, you don't have the humility and vulnerability of actually going, wait, I am as evil as I am good, you know? And that's what I really learned through studying and practicing Buddhism is really being able to embody the non-dualism of life and that we all contain our binary. So to project this like evilness onto other people is to basically negate the evilness in yourself, which makes them whenever I'll do that or I'll lash out with somebody or I'll have that feeling of, of anger, like they're bad, I'm good. I can turn it around and go, well, I'm, they're good and I'm bad, you know, just as much as it's the opposite. Um, and that's something that I think that the, the more we forget about that, that non-dualism where we need the two binaries together, like they're inseparable, um, 
the more we forget that, the, the more we think that that Earth is and the world is something that it's not. You know, that's very illusory thinking, I think. The good versus evil, the, 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 this real like, dichotomous understanding of, of just like human nature even. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to be said uh, about the power from just understanding that, that everything is inherently contradictory, nothing is, is perfect, uh, nobody is perfect. I know I'm kind of repeating myself here, and these are often cliches, right? But, but it is very powerful, and we don't actually believe it. And, and of course, we're all capable of everything. And the thing is, you know, this is something I want to talk about later, is I, I, I like to think I'm a good person. I try to do good things, but I, I hurt people constantly, and I've been hurt by people constantly. And I've taken things too personal. And I know this is not just me. And it's because we can't just point at a person or at a thing or anything in this mixed up world and say that mm -hmm. this is pure, be a pure good, pure evil. It, everything is a mix. Everything is in flux. Yeah. Um, it's, it's this, this sometimes frustrating, sometimes beautiful uh, uh, dialectical dance. Uh, mm -hmm. of, of the interplay of opposites. And I believe when you add up those opposites, you, you do get a whole. But of course, it, this whole manifests itself through these, these contradictions, through these currents, mm -hmm. through quote unquote good and evil, uh, what have you. And I suspect, uh, you know, you may not have the exact same formulations in some of your, your philosophical thinking, but I suspect that, that we might be similar in those regards. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like, I, I just think it's important to be aware of the fact that like, your point of view may not be sound either, you know? <laughs> and yeah. so like having that, you know, having that hubris is kind of like scary in a way. Um, so yeah, yeah. Oof. <laughs> so I, I do want to tell the people at home, you know, we have a question sheet and, and I did write out some of my long rants to, <laughs> to prepare as well with Jesus <laughs> for, for what she has to go through. So here's one of them. Um, I think one of the metaphors found in Gnosticism really applies to the creative process. Like when we conceive of, of a piece of art in our heads, uh, the sort of platonic ideal, it's, it's perfect. It's in our heads as something that is completely perfect. But when we materialize it, when we literally bring it into the material world, it gets kind of messed up, kind of fucked up. And then, the, but there's life to this fucked up in this. You know, the work changes, it grows, it's no longer perfect, but, but it's alive. Do you find that your work takes on a life of its own? Like, are there any songs or aspects of this new album that you weren't expecting or that you kind of discovered in the process or, or stuff that took on new meaning for you? Oh, the, the entire process. Like this actually was a record that I made um, with the experiment of letting like, letting the chi flow. So basically, my, my whole experiment was to get in the studio and then to get my demos, work with someone that I trusted, and then whatever they came up with. Like if it didn't offend me, I would just let the chi flow, you know. But then if there was some sort of blockage or something getting in the way of me feeling like the song was flowing, I would intervene. But but if, I, if, if it felt good to me, I just let it go. And so that gave me this freedom of being able to bring in new ideas and bring in collaborations in a way where I wasn't so, it, it, it didn't feel as confrontational to me because I was letting it, I was letting it take form in reality first in a way, even though the songs were written, whereas in the past I would, meticulously hear that world in my head and then try to execute it and always fail and then feel sort of resentful that like it'll never be what's in my head and then on top of that I would say that like let's say I do have an album like I made Archon I had the final mixes listening to it and, it, and for, for that moment the, the music is mine you know like the final product of music is mine but then the day that I give it away such as on Friday, June 24th, when the album was, was released, it, it's no longer mine, and it, I no longer, it no longer only responds to the context that I give it. And then when other people attach different contexts or feelings onto the music, it just becomes this totally different entity. And so I listen to the record a lot before I put it out, because that's, that's when I get to really like enjoy it. And then once I put it out, I can barely listen to it because it's just like it becomes something else that I, I no longer can really like have to myself. Yeah. So um, being lost and alienated, it's not exclusively a Gnostic theme, but but it's a major one. 
what inspired your track Lost? And and do you feel that this track ends on on a hopeful note? Hmm. Yes, I think it does. Um, well, what inspired Lost was, uh, um, on like a more conceptual level, was just the feeling of like everyone that I I knew at the time, including myself, were just really disillusioned with the prospects of creating meaning in our lives like that's tied into the system or society like you know having all these skills and every so much potential but then only being able to um consent to like this extractive or exploitative labor and not really being able to have like a life of deep purpose and and sense of place and so um, when I moved back to Wisconsin, I started to really reconnect with nature. Like, like I've always loved it, but then I, I realized how nature gives me a place, gives me purpose. It make it allows me to understand kind of the heart hierarchies of the, the kingdom of Earth so much more clearly. Because when I'm stuck in this society, it's hierarchy within hum humanity, which I find to be really convoluted and it doesn't make sense and like the overarching like hierarchies in the kingdom of like the entire world and so um yeah so it just makes it makes me feel more um i just feel like when i'm when i'm in nature i understand like the game i understand what life is all about I, I, everything is clear to me you know and then once i go into a city or have to operate within this other context it just all feels like this doesn't make sense sense and like and there's so much weird weirdness to it that doesn't i don't know <laughs> i'm kind of like i kind of went off on a track there but that's basically what lost is about it's just feeling like um lost you know yeah you know this is the show for for going for going on rant for going down yeah, rabbit okay, holes okay. And of course, uh, just like the, the next question I'm going to ask, you know, some of these questions are, uh, hey, Nico, what's the meaning of life? I'm not necessarily expecting you to Love have, it. you know, it, 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 an amazing, amazing, <laughs> perfectly uh, thought out systematic answer that is going to cure all of our problems, right? But I just want to hear some of your speculations, thoughts, and then, as I said, questions. So, so continuing with Lost, so I, I've noticed the same thing. Like I know so many people who are talented, compassionate, dynamic, and, and they can't mm -hmm. seem to find their place in society or, or a use of their talents to, to, mm -hmm. to help people, to create their art, what have you. Um, now, the internet has worked out for, for some people, not, not just artists, but also like academics, um, uh, some scholars, uh, para-academics, uh, lots of interesting people. But mm -hmm. it hasn't worked out for, for everybody. I, I don't even really know if it's worked out for the majority. Do you have any thoughts on on what these people that that we both know of the people that you wrote lost about about what 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 we could or should do? Hmm. Honestly, I think it this sounds like an extreme answer, but I think it's the only answer, and that is to rebuild outside of the system that feels like it's exploiting us. Because trying to change it or trying to find your way through it is just really not going to happen. Because the whole thing only survives and exists because of the very qualities that are so unfulfilling um, to the people that are participating in it or producing culture. So I honestly think there needs to be a movement where people that want to be a part of something much more spiritual or meaningful or profound come together and create that for themselves because it's just not going to happen in, in this like neoliberal capitalist hellscape. It's just <laughs> nothing can survive. There's no air in a vacuum, you know. It's like it's it's it's. I think it's a lost hope at this point. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I'm basically black pilled. Uh, my my reformist tendencies have been <laughs> squeezed out of me, so I I don't you know I don't have any answers. That one sounds as good to me as any of them. So that's all uh, I can think of. No, it's it's perfect. It's, it's an amazing answer. So, so so you already mentioned this in the discussion uh, that 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 you felt like you were going through a lot of change and you actually experienced ego death. And, and I see this in the album a, a lot of themes of inner growth, change, internal mm -hmm. internal journey. Can you can you tell us about this process and of course if it's too personal you know you don't have to go that deep or you can go as deep as you want but it, can, can you tell us a little bit about this yeah um so for like the past five years my life just completely turned upside down i went through a divorce i went through a bunch of uh, long-term relationships ending and so basically like 
almost every important relationship in my adult life from that moment on has like vanished. And then, um, and then I was turning 30. So it was the whole Saturn return. It really kicked my ass and I had to, um, really face a lot of my demons and face also the realities of the world and also living in, living in the loneliness of being the only one that can kind of do the work to fix myself. Um, that just put a lot on, on my lap that I felt like I could no longer ignore. And so, um, in working through all of that and feeling like I had to build myself from the ground up again, um, it took a long time and it was very, you know, it's just, just like anything, like building up this life and then it kind of everything changing overnight. And then you have to figure out who you are without it. It's like, um, turns out that I feel like I'm a lot better now, <laughs> like facing the ego death, the psychic death, like really like going into the cave and like, um, really looking within was incredibly profound and I was able to let go of so much baggage, but, um, but that's like gnarly stuff. And now I know why people put it off <laughs> or they <laughs> repress it or they compartmentalize and they, cause ooh, it can be hard when you're just staring, staring at yourself and, and the mistakes you've made or, or not. And you know, the life that you're, that you're already living. Cause once, when, when you turn 30, it's like, okay, this is my life. Like this is a life, this is a lifetime. And there's a lot of karmic work to be done before, you know, before I go. So it's up to me to make it happen. Yeah. Um, I, I can sound particularly insightful into this work because if I don't tell the people at home that you actually left some some notes on each of the songs on Genius, but uh, I, I guess I will <laughs> reveal that. But uh, in your notes for the fall, um, you mentioned the hero's journey. Uh, so I guess this also connects to what we were just talking about. Like, do you find this a useful concept? Do you think it's quote unquote real for everybody? Is it just real for you? And the second part of my question is that at the end of the journey, the, the hero returns home having a sort of gnosis. Like, do you feel like you completed a hero's journey cycle or, or are you still on it? I think I completed it. Um, and I think I'm still trying to build the habits that I learned. Um, because when you go through that sort of like inner excavation, there's habits, habits of thinking, habits of reacting and in taking care of those, that's a practice, you know? And so I'll find myself reacting to, to a situation in a way where I know that I'm letting my shadow kind of take over and you can go, nope, nope, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, but, uh, I do. I definitely believe that I was on a hero's journey, and that's something that Randall Dunn, the co-producer, and I bonded over. Um, is that he saw I was going through it, and he really, you know, he, he said he loves a hero's journey, and so so we kind of bonded over that. That being the course of the record as well. Well, talking about cycles and cycling back, so in the songs, the fall, fault, desire, I, I see repeating themes of, of hurting and being hurt by those close to us. And like I was saying before, it, it's a bit of a cliche, but, but I see due to our fallibility, and it is almost inevitable, though, of course, we can lower it by doing the shadow work and self-observation and the hard work that you're talking about. We can at least lower it a bit. But due to our fallibility, often about mal malice, we we hurt those close to us. And, and I guess a, a very, again, I, I, I don't accept, expect a, a, a systematic answer, but how do we live like this if it's inevitable? <laughs> I think we just need to be kinder to ourselves and to everyone around us and to, you know, not be afraid to stand up for what you need and to speak for what you need, but also to not, um, to not be afraid of changes that are made and things that happen. Because I, I think it goes back into that, that villain versus kind of like righteous person, um, hero versus villain, where it's like, it's so easy for us to kind of protect ourselves by, by in, you know, pointing blame at somebody else. Whereas sometimes there is no one to blame. And I know it's easier to take, take the blame out on someone, you can direct your anger and sadness and depression. But, I think that can also be really unhealthy. I just think that a lot of interpersonal relationships are really, they're also suffering from these archonic times as well. You know, we're all just very, um, 
repressed in many ways because we're told that we're not able to understand nuance. You know? <laughs> this world is not very nuanced. And so um, that also happens at a micro level, I think. Yeah. Yeah, no, I no, I agree, and I, I think there's this idea that this is a time of particular social freedom uh, and self-expression, but I find it to be a very repressive time, and I find that people mm -hmm. do a lot of repressing by telling themselves that they're they're so free. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, I, I feel that a lot, especially just being like, feeling like when I stand up for myself, I get reprimanded or castigated, but then I'm told that, like, I am free in a way where it just doesn't really make sense. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I got into modern Gnosticism through a, a French mystic named Louis Claude de Saint Martin, and he obsessively wrote about desire. And he said, "For our really? salvation, yeah, yeah." It, it, it's actually um, it, uh, I'm actually part of a sort of a Gnostic group called Marginism, where where we study his works, and and we actually sort of found it confusing at first because when we read about desire in a religious context, it's usually a negative, right? Not exclusively, not, not in Vajrayana Buddhism, for instance, but in, but in you know, mainstream Buddhism, the desire is often looked as, as kind of a negative thing, something we have to work through. Uh, obviously, lots of forms of, uh, of Christianity, you know, desire is viewed as, mm -hmm. as, as kind of an enemy. Uh, but Louis Claude, he said that we have to stop being people of the torrent, uh, people of the river, people who are caught up in the flooding stream of life. And instead, we have to become people of desire. And what he, and he means a lot by that, I, you know, I can't get into it, but yeah. we're reorienting, it's also understanding our desire, but reorientating our desire, knowing that it is inevitable and fixating our, our desire on, on, the, on divinity and uh, reorientating that uh, towards there. And in Gnosticism, like it's Sophia's desire that, that causes the divine fall, uh, but it's also the source of its salvation because she desires, you know, so, so greatly for this reconciliation. And even though I say the fall, and, you know, we've talked a lot about the negatives of this world, uh, I, I'm not one of those people who, who thinks that we're here to, to learn and suffer, but I haven't been able to articulate that it is important that we're here. Um, and again, I, I don't know if I believe in Gnosticism literally or figuratively, uh, you know, if this is just a philosophical metaphor, if there is, you know, something out there. But, but to make a long story short, the, the expression of consciousness needs materiality. And it's, it's not always fun, and I don't know why, and I haven't figured it out, and I never will. But that comes through desire in, in the Gnostic sense, right? Materiality comes through desire. So what does desire mean for you, and, and do you see a cosmic angle to desire? Yes, that's cool. That's interesting because I've, I've really struggled with understanding desire because I feel like it is so multifaceted. In the beginning, I thought, okay, desire is bad, but I'm somebody that that um, feels, like maybe on a cosmological sense, feels like desire is like this innate creative force. It's the thing that keeps one alive. Like desire is a birth in some ways because it is, it is, it is the hope of something to come. And so I find desire to be really motivating, and that's actually what um, I I was kind of inspired to. Well, I spent some time in Zen, Rinzai Zen Monastery, um, and I asked my Roshi about desire actually, because I said, you know, desire. I start, you know, like, I like should I should I turn my back on desire and the things that that it pushes me to do, you know, because desire is bad. And he said, no, there's such a thing as wholesome desire. And wholesome desire is great because that is the impetus, that is the birth of, of, of a potential awakening, you know? And um, and I find that to be really beautiful. So then I think about desire as this very just like, yeah, this very creative entity that like when, when I feel it enter into me, like this desire feeling, I feel like I'm unstoppable. <laughs> and that's such an amazing feeling because it's this feeling of energy and of life and, and, and reaffirming the creative potential of life, you know? Um, that's what I like. I like the unknowns of life and the surprise. And I think desire makes me feel like very awakened in that way. Yeah. Well, uh, talking about uh, awakening, uh, Zen Buddhism, uh, non-dualism. Do, do you consider yourself a non-dualist? And, and what does non-dualism mean for you? Well, um, I struggled a lot with non-dualism. Um, because it just didn't make sense to me because I was just like, wow, okay, well, you know, I see good and evil, black and white, like the world is, is made of these two things, you know? 
And then um, I went to the monastery and I participated in this Shigendo ritual, which is Shigendo is this uh, practice or tradition um, of like mountain Buddhism that incorporates aspects of Shinto. Mm. And the monastery that I, that I like my Sangha or whatever mm. is also a, a, a Shigendo practice place. And so they did this um, ritual and um, there was this fire and, you know, we were throwing things in the fire and there was like chanting, of course. Um, it was for Futo Mio, this, this deity in Shigendo. Um, anyway, just throughout the, just the mayhem of the, of the ceremony happening and just how overwhelming it was, I became overwhelmed with this idea of, of all of the elements combining together in order to create one thing and that not, not one element can be removed. And then I understand. I started to understand how black and white, good and evil, all that are inextricably linked in a way that that you just can't. I couldn't ignore anymore. Like I couldn't see somebody and judge them for bad things, knowing that they also have the good things. Like that they create. That they. You know what I mean? That they continue their binary. And so that was um, just really. Over, it was really fascinating to me to, to have that sort of insight and then to follow it. And um, it's hard because our life, our world is so dualistic in the way that the media is and the way that people treat each other. And it's very like, yeah, again, like fundamentalist in that, in that respect. But, um, but I see things differently now. And so it's hard to integrate that worldview, like a non-dualistic worldview into like Western being like a Western musician and having to be like, I will not play the game. I know, I, I know the truth. I know the truth. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and I think myself and a lot of people, you know, obviously a lot of spiritual curious people uh, watch and listen to this show. And, and, you know, I've had similar experiences also on retreats and in meditation centers. Yeah. And then it's like, OK, well, now, now I know. Right. And then I come back to the real world where I have to, mm -hmm. you know, go to my job and interact with my wife and, you know, uh, deal with the frustrations of life. And it's and it's it's like, oh, OK, well, why? Why is that gone? You know, it was so clear when I when I was when I was <laughs> yeah. up there on the mountain so it, it really it really is a struggle even after having these these profound insights these profound experiences mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well that's uh i i think we're already at wrap up uh it's been uh, amazing I, I can't wait for uh your next album which i will again bother you to come on the show and talk about um but uh, yeah uh the, so uh plugs again are, are you doing any touring so zolajesus.com uh but are you doing any tours or anything else you want to promote uh related to Arcon or related to your work before before we sign off yeah well my record Arcon is out now and i'm about to go on a tour with the cult and black rebel motorcycle club in like the midwest and mid east and so in, in the states so check out zolajesus.com for tour dates um and i'll be going on a u.s tour and hopefully beyond hopefully canada yeah, um, to, to Montreal, great city. Yeah. Yeah. I love Montreal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, thanks again. Oh, wait, I, I'm going to quickly do my plugs. Uh, hey, we're talking about meditation and stuff. Uh, what, what am I, I? I'm a freelance writer, but I, I also uh, teach mindfulness based stress reduction. As part of that, I, I do free meditation every Sunday morning. It's, it's how I uh, keep my meditation instructing talents sharp and also how I give back because I am a little uncomfortable charging for meditation, but I also need to eat. So uh, that's 11 a.m. Montreal time. It's free. Uh, go to mylandmeditation.substack.com. There's a newsletter there. You can sign up that just gives you the link and lets you know, you know, if, if it's on. Sometimes I have to cancel or, or, or things come up. Uh, check that out. Holygrail.substack.com is my parish in Montreal. Uh, the Owenite Church sponsors this podcast. Um, they've got a great program that is free at joanite.org slash, that's the wrong link, uh, yoanite.org slash learn. Uh, they have a free course there that is the introduction to the Joanite tradition. I uh, highly recommend it. You'll love it. It'll be fun. It's not meant to brainwash you, but if you have any kind of interest in Gnosticism, in organized Gnosticism, uh, check that out, people. I think you will get uh, an awesome kick out of it. One last plug. 
uh, gcast.ie is where I'm going to school. It is an alternative debt-free university. I'm doing research on Gnosticism there. You should just check it out even if you don't want to go to school. If you want to go to school, you, you should go there. But uh, you may want to keep an eye on them and their YouTube channel because they are always releasing awesome talks from some of the world's best scholars. Okay, this is Goodbye For Real. <laughs> Thanks again, Nika. For Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too.